Well, welcome to the Family Ties Podcast. My name is Julia Avery, and this is my sister and co-host. Hi, guys. This is Kelly Kelly here. Hope you guys are doing good. We have something special for you all today. Um, This is going to be our first interview ever for the podcast. Um, We would love to um, introduce you to Dr. Rachel Coleman. She is the Executive Director of the Coalition for Responsible Home Education, and she is so kind to join us today via Zoom to um, chat about some of her past experiences and then also um, her research and study and what she's learned over the years with her work. Uh, Welcome, Rachel. Hi. Welcome. (laughs) Um, So if you would like to just start by introducing us to your background with homeschooling, your family life, all those things, just dive right in and kind of let us know your end of it. Absolutely. So I was homeschooled from kindergarten all the way through high school, um, as were my siblings. And my parents became very involved in the local homeschool community. In fact, for a while, they were the chair of the regional homeschool association in our area. So I grew up um, you know, going to all the homeschool conventions and everything as well, very involved in the homeschool world. And then I went to college. Um, my homeschool background academically was very solid. So when I went off to college, um, I had a full tuition scholarship. And wow. I almost got a 4.0. There's actually a whole story about, I, I'm trying to tell my own kids not to worry too much about 4.0s because it's, it's a little more grief than is necessary. <laughs> I feel the same exact way as a 3.9er. Right, exactly. It's like, when you, you know, when you lost it, I was like, man, if that had happened freshman year, it would have been better. It was just so, it was traumatic. But yeah. of course, it did very well. So um, academically and everything, and uh, my sibling, you know, my sister after me, she got the full ride scholarship that I kind of wanted. So that was fun. But, you know, we were both academically well prepared. So um, in college, I ended up, studying history and I really enjoyed it and so for my master's program I wanted to do a history project that also brought in my homeschool background so I actually did a history of the homeschool community in the county where the college that I went to was so this was Delaware County Indiana I I noticed that nobody had really looked at a local area development of a homeschool community and I had a couple professors who were actually really big on um, like networking theory and things like that so I looked at um, different networks and gatekeepers and and growth over time and that kind of thing it was very interesting Um, one thing I found in working on my master's degree uh, my master's thesis is that the homeschool community in the 90s in that county had been very controlled by a homeschool group that was a Christian homeschool group that was the predominant one in the county. And so almost all information went through that group and it ran um, a very large, very successful co-op, um, but they had very strict rules because it was a Christian group. So I spoke with one woman who was a Mormon and wasn't even allowed to teach a beginning ballet class through the co-op because she wasn't considered a Christian by the group's rules. So what was interesting was that some of that gatekeeping began to change around the year 2000 with the advent of Yahoo groups. And someone started a Yahoo homeschool group um, for the county specifically, and it just took off and ended up with tons and tons of people on it. So now if you wanted information about a specific aspect of homeschooling, you could just post it and get answers from a whole bunch of different people. And they weren't answers that were curated through any group. So uh, the gatekeeping role that some of the homeschool organizations had in the 90s declined with the advent of the internet and these Yahoo groups. Since I wrote my master's thesis, which I finished in 2010, um, a lot of those old Yahoo groups have uh, migrated to Facebook. Um, But the decentralization of homeschool networks has continued um, where it's harder for any one group to control them. Now, there are some things where there still is uh, sort of a dominance or control by Christian homeschooling groups. Um, One of those places is state homeschool associations. One of the reasons for that is that the people who get into homeschooling and really want to go on with it long term and it becomes part of who they are, are often those who are homeschooling for religious reasons. Not always. Um, but it, that's sort of the predominant group in terms of um, what you might call homeschool long haulers. Um, and so they end up building those networks because it's very much 
part of who they are and important to their identity and who they are. So they end up building and controlling a lot of those uh, physical groups. And the other place, oh, no, I forgot the other place. But, but the point is, there, there's a big decentralization, but there still are um, different groups that are, are sometimes controlled by specific portions of the homeschooling world. So it can be interesting to try to figure out where information is coming from sometimes, um, or who is acting like a gatekeeper in what situation. Um, but it was very interesting. So that's what I did my master's thesis on. Then I started my PhD, and I began to study the history of children and childhood, which was incredibly interesting. Um, the professor I studied under is uh, relatively well known in the children's rights uh, circles and a big proponent of greater children's rights. So I learned a lot about the limits on um, that we place on children and also the limitations to our sort of nation's claims to care about children. Um, so for example, you know, there's even right now with all people talking about child trafficking, it's frustrating because if we really were a nation that cared about children, we would fix our foster care system. We would fix our child welfare system. We would fix our schools. And instead, we spend more money on our prisons and our military yes. than on institutions des designed to serve our young. So we pay lip service to the idea of children as being important and sort of the most important thing. We do not back that up in any shape or form. And it's not just those institutions. It's also in how we approach children, um, the amount of rights we do or do not give them. Mm -hmm. For example, um, I knew a, a young woman who was 17 and her parents um, disagreed with who she was dating for reasons that were very arbitrary. They, I mean, if you, this girl was a Girl Scout, okay? Like she was fine, but they effectively placed her under house arrest and you know, didn't let her go anywhere or, or see anyone. And there was nothing that could be done because when you're 17, you really don't have rights under our system. Exactly. Exactly. When you're 18, that suddenly completely changes, but we don't phase into that. We don't say, well, you know, maybe adolescents should be gradually given more rights. Instead, we really emphasize parental control to an extent that is um, ultimately detrimental. And it, it's, it's very frustrating. So, um, so I was working on my PhD and at around that time, my younger brother contacted me. He was also being homeschooled. He was in high school at the time and he was really worried about a girl he knew. And he got me in contact with her. And I found out that despite having just turned 17, um, her parents hadn't given her any formal education since about the fourth grade. She was being homeschooled. Um, and she had cobbled together some textbooks she'd found from various sources, but she didn't really have time to teach herself out of them, in addition to the fact that it's not really fair to expect someone to teach themselves fully out of textbooks with no guidance or support, because she was also being expected to care for her younger siblings. And it was actually worse than that, because she was working under the counter cleaning houses about 60 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And oh as well. And that was what her family was living on because her father was abusive and did not have a job because he was abusive. You know, he sat around, watched TV and yelled at everybody. And, you know, it was abusive physically as well as emotionally to them and to their mother. And so this girl that my brother, you know, connected me with, she was really upset because she saw college as a way to get out. None of her family got to college. She was like, I want to get to college. You know, I can get out. I can make something better for myself myself and not have a life like this. But her parents had not given her older sister any documents of education at all when she turned 18. You know, there's no diploma, there's no transcript on top of there not being any actual education. Mm -hmm. because in most cases, homeschooling parents completely control their children's access to a diploma and transcript. If a child from a dysfunctional family attends a public high school, their parents cannot control their, rec their educational records. Their parents do not determine whether they get a diploma. Their parents do not control their access to a diploma. They can get all of that in spite of their parents um, and, and hopefully have access to supportive adults through the school system. Obviously, that doesn't always work perfectly, but there are at least other people in their lives independent of their parents. But when a child is homeschooled and is in a dysfunctional family, their parent has complete control over all of that. And it ends up being almost worse than a high school dropout because there's not even any documentation of education through 10th grade or something like that. There's nothing. And so she was very concerned about um, what that meant. And I, 
at the time, I had done some, a little bit of research into some of the, um, you know, maybe negative aspects of homeschooling when I was working on my master's thesis, but really very little. I, I wasn't interested in, you know, is it good or bad? I was just interested in looking at the growth and development of a specific homeschool community over time. And so this really sent me digging into the homeschool law in my state and trying to figure out what could be done for this girl. And I, I learned that almost nothing could be done. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. The only thing you could do is call Child Protective Services, which frankly, caseworkers are not trained in assessing children's education. Uh -uh. Um, it, it, you know, so if you have a case of educational neglect, it really is not that great that in many states, the only place you can report it is Child Protective Services. For, further, one thing I've learned in my research since then is that Child Protective Services in many states will not accept a report of educational neglect unless it is paired with other complaints. Oh my mm -hmm. God. So like they have to have proof of abuse or something? Oh, yeah. There has physical abuse. allegations of abuse. So if you allege that, that there's abuse in a case and there's educational neglect, then Child Protective Services will investigate. But if you have a family where there isn't abuse, but there's zero education, and it's a state where the only way to try to, you know, do anything about it is, is calling Child Protective Services, in some cases, they won't accept a report like that because they have so many other things that they investigate. They're not going to just, especially when they're not really qualified to investigate educational neglect. Um, usually states educational neglect statutes is related to child protective services is more about parents not sending children to school. So they're a lot more used to seeing, um, you know, chronic truancy and abuse. And maybe the parents are also abusing substances themselves. Like that sort of conglomeration is what they're, they're a lot more used to. But a family that says they're homeschooling and not, not educating their kids. It's really, it, the system is not set up to try to fix that problem. Right. Um, in this case, I actually did call Child Protective Services because there also was abuse and there was um, this financial abuse, this, this child labor, you know, whatever you want to call it exactly. Uh, frankly, you could even use the term human trafficking um, because they're exploiting their children for labor. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the definitions of trafficking is labor exploitation. So, um, I did call and I, I didn't stay in contact because I didn't want, um, I didn't want anyone to find out I'd made that call. And there's so much animus against child protective services in homeschool circles. Um, you know, I didn't mm -hmm. want to you know, tell my brother I'd necessarily done that because it just, um, you know, I wasn't sure what would happen. But what I found out later when I talked to her is that child protective services did visit. She didn't know at the time who called. But she told me that was the moment when she realized that someone actually cared about her mm -hmm. oh. because someone cared enough to make that call. Right. And, and she also told me that while some things got better, you know, not everything was fixed, but that her parents realized that there were limits and that they were not infallible and that there was only so far they could push it before something would happen. Mm. And that things did improve. Um, now it was, in some ways too late for her because she was already 17 and had not received any education. So she ended up going on to get her, to move out of her parents' house, move in with another relative after she turned 18, get her GED, get her driver's license, um, get her documents. I think she didn't have a social security number. And then she went to community college and intended to eventually transfer to a four-year university, but it was, it was too much. Um, she got her associate's degree and I think has toyed with the idea of transferring to four-year university several times, but hasn't. So she was not able to obtain her dream of a, a four-year, you know, bachelor's degree mm -hmm. um, and is now mid-20s. So it, it's one of those situations where this was a person who was very driven um, and yet had so many roadblocks in her way. And that's the frustrating thing is um, there, there actually was a case where... Um, in 2014, there was a Washington Post article about a young man in uh, Virginia who had wanted to go to public school. And Virginia's law is set up so that if you use their religious exemption to homeschool, the phrasing suggests the child needs to also have a religious exemption from schooling. And his argument was, I didn't have any religious objection to schooling. I wanted to go to public school and wasn't allowed to. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually did set up some effort to look into, you know, or, or maybe think about what the law maybe actually should mean and should kids be asked their opinion too as part of the religious exemption process. Because there's also a regular homeschool law in Virginia where you have to like show proof of progress and things. It's not like you can't homeschool outside of this religious exemption. The religious exemption functions to get you out of all accountability. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that happened after this article was published is that the Homeschool Legal Defense Association 
published a piece responding to it saying, this is a case of homeschooling working because see, it made this boy love education and want education. And now he's getting his bachelor's degree at Georgetown and got through all this adversity. And isn't that amazing? And it's so frustrating because your goal should not be, you know, like, look, some kids manage to overcome adversity. So it's okay. It's like, well, maybe they shouldn't have to. Right. Right. That shouldn't be there in the first place for them to deal with. In our homeschool group, there was a particular family that had, um, I think six to 10 kids, like four of them were grown up and out of the home, but um, they were homeschooling them. And I mean, they were just this kind of fringy family, just like all the others that we grew up around. But uh, the kids would boast that they hadn't made it past fifth grade and that they didn't do schoolwork. And, you know, to them, they thought they were getting by with something. But to Mm -hmm. me, I was just thinking you're, you're not only being robbed, but you're kind of cool with the fact that you're being robbed of your education. But I think in Kentucky, the, the, the thing you're mentioning about homeschool laws in Kentucky, like all a family has to do is just state their intent to homeschool. There's, there's no forms they have to fill out. There's, there's no accountability. There's no testing that takes place or, you know, checkups to make sure that you are, uh, there's way too much trust. (laughs) It it is a lot of trust to put on parents who, you know, are human. And, um, a lot of the times like don't even have their own high school diploma and they're supposed to be teaching multiple kids, different grade levels. I think this is a huge problem. And I, I wonder how often you run into this with the work that you do. Right. So after I became involved in this specific situation I've been discussing um, after my brother contacted me, it made me start thinking about all the people that I'd known growing up. And in Indiana, where I grew up, the law is the same as what you're describing. In fact, it's, it's, it's actually worse. <laughs> it can be to- worse. That's the bad thing. Like, that's the crazy thing. <laughs> you don't have to report to anyone that you're homeschooling. So there's no list of who is homeschooled. Oh, uh, my God. So these kids just like literally fall through the cracks. Yeah, there's no record, there's, there's nothing. And there's 11 states that are like that, where you don't even have to tell anyone. And one of those states is Texas. It's a very populous state. There's no list. So it, it really creates a perfect way for kids to fall through the cracks. And um, I started thinking about the families I knew, and some of them, you know, they, they, their kids did very well and went on to university, like my siblings and I. And um, I actually knew somebody who was admitted to MIT, and he went to MIT and is working in the tech world out in the, um, on the West Coast now. But I also thought about other cases I knew where that is absolutely not what had happened, including cases like the one that you mentioned, um, where there are very large numbers of children, and yet all of them ended up just still living at home as adults and never leaving or getting a diploma. And it's not even just like, not everybody needs a college degree, but when you have nine, 10, 11 kids and nobody, nobody gets a college degree, you start to wonder, you know, maybe there's something getting in the way, you know, because usually um, there's going to be some variation. Someone's going to get some training or some whatever. They're not all going to be working at the local McDonald's. Um, And it just made me start thinking about cases where I knew kids that they, that their families were different. Like I, I knew in some kids I'd go over to their house that education didn't happen there the way it happened at my house. You know, we sat down to have school time. We had a schedule, you know, we each had a portfolio at the end of each year. My mother was very methodical and responsible in how she went about it. Um, but I realized that there was sort of a code of not saying anything and just assuming that the other parents must be doing the right thing. And, you know, I found out later, like you're talking to one of my friends that her parents had talked about a number of different families they knew where they were like, oh yeah, I don't think, you know, I don't think they're really providing good education, but they never said anything to those parents because there's this taboo against interfering in another family. Mm -hmm. Um, And so actually, after I was involved in founding CRHE, I was talking to my mom about it once. And she said to me, you know, maybe an organization like yours could help people like me know what to do about a family like, and then she mentioned that family that my brother had gotten me in touch with the girl. And that took me aback. It really floored me because it meant she saw Mm -hmm. saw that there were problems and she didn't do anything. And I turned and I looked at her and I said, mom, you were supposed to call child protective services. And she immediately said, I could never do that. I could never do that to another homeschooling family. And And I said, look, mom, that's the problem. That's the problem. Because there's no system of accountability. And it's it's funny because 
in that conversation, she told me she doesn't think there should be any government accountability because for many parents who homeschool, um, particularly in cur- conservative circles, they see the government as a bad thing. So, you know, mm-hmm. you do the government. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see- they see them as they're going to come and take your kids away. It's like yeah. a threat kind of thing, oh, right? who practice drills for when when the social worker would come to the door i mean we had a phone mm-hmm. number julie's like, like yep yep <laughs> <laughs> we actually did a drill but we had hsla's phone number on the inside of a cupboard so for listeners who, who maybe aren't familiar the homeschool legal defense association was founded in 1983 and it worked to try to legalize homeschooling and the interesting thing is if you talk to people who were homeschooling and involved in the homeschool movement before then they saw the hslda as a johnny come lately because a lot of the heavy lifting had already been done. HSLDA today um, sort of seems to portray themselves as these, these, the force that got homeschooling legalized, but there actually were a bunch of groups working on it back then. The Rutherford Institute, uh, John Holt and his group, even Ray Moore was involved. There were a lot of individuals involved. Um, and then HSLDA came in. So they did, they were involved in some of the latter part of, of legalizing homeschooling in various states. Um, Although they used tactics that were so iffy that Ray Moore wrote an entire white paper in about 2000, 1999, maybe, absolutely excoriating Michael Ferris and HSLDA and saying that they were destroying the homeschool movement by sowing division and through their reactionary tactics. So it's really fascinating if you actually look at some of that early development, there was a lot of disagreement about what the homeschooling movement should be known by. And there were a lot of people who didn't want it to be known by the sort of reactionary sentiment that HSLDA so often sows. Um, uh, But that's slightly off track. The point I'm trying to make is, oh, okay. Um, They initially said, (laughs) this is also something Ray Moore um, was upset about HSLDA for later, that they would disband HSLDA once homeschooling was legal in all 50 states. That occurred in 1994. HSLDA did not disband. Instead, they began to build themselves as legal insurance. So that if you you bought an HSLDA membership, they would protect you if there were any legal issues with your homeschool. Now, there's a couple issues with that. One is homeschooling is legal. If you follow the law, your homeschool is legal. And so, like, there's not, you don't need legal insurance. You don't get legal insurance and other things either. And if you look at some of the HSLDAs, the, the, um, on their website, they print all these stories where they're like, see, we stepped in and helped. We saved this family. And it's like from a paperwork mistake. Wait, like, you know, like, I just- see that as like a complete violation of protecting those children because they, they, they see their protection as the family unit, which I feel like is the first big mistake because the whole point of homeschooling is to better your, those children's lives, right? Like you're homeschooling them because you want them to have a better education, et cetera. And you want them to be better off in life. But um, I feel like that comes in and they say family, but what they really mean is protecting the parents, no matter what F the kids forget, you know, whatever is actually going on there with the kids. Um, well, I, I don't know, Rachel, if you agree with this, but where we came from, and I know, I know things have been changing and, and there are more people now homeschooling for non-religious reasons than before. But when we were in the thick of it, it was mainly for religious reasons and mainly as a method to keep anything that was secular out of yeah. the lives of their children um, and then away from the influence um, anything that could be seen like music, television, movies, um, science, mm-hmm. these things that um, everything had to be focused around scripture. And so it was like controlled conditioning. So to it them is- and to the people we grew up around laws and of course the government were scary because they want to indoctrinate your children. They want them to be secularized. They have this whole thing that they want to take control of your children. And so they would view it as more laws just mean that we can't raise our children to be biblically minded. So Kelly, I hadn't got to my dissertation yet. <laughs> You're getting there. Okay. <laughs> let, me, let me talk about more of that with my dissertation in just a moment, because I looked at evangelical ideas about education over time. And what I found was super interesting. So you're absolutely right about um, most homeschoolers in the nineties and many homeschoolers since then um, have been homeschooling with that mindset. And so the government isn't just like something that's going to get up in your business. It's also potentially anti-God in this framework. But what HSLDA 
did is, is it made, you know, it sort of fostered that fear. It played on every one of those fears or concerns um, in an attempt to keep people afraid because scared people buy legal membership. And that was how they got their money. And it's interesting because if you look at their website now, they're starting to shift. Now, if you get a membership, you get access to templates for creating an IEP for your child with disabilities, which is fascinating because they never, ever recommended that you create an IEP for your child with disabilities. But it's clear the way that they're starting to shift and say, okay, maybe we should say, if you buy membership, we'll give you educational resources. It's like, we could have just done that before, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, well, you buy a membership and we'll save you from the scary government. Um, but one of the things that I think is worth mentioning is I have spoken with multiple individuals who lived in families where there was child abuse, um, sometimes very severe child abuse and HSLDA got their parents out from uh, child protective services investigations. Because the thing to understand about HSLDA is they promised to defend their members against any social worker at the door. In fact, they explicitly said it does not matter if the social worker says homeschooling has anything to do with the charges. And their claim was that that's because sometimes they would just not truthfully state that or something. Um, but when I really started to look into it, I found that HSLDA never checked for abuse before they would defend a family. They would exactly. Speak and then they would say the charges are false. And there was at least one case where they actually defended this family and said they were good, you know, upstanding people and all this stuff. And then it, it, the rest of the details came in and they had been keeping their 11 adopted children in cages and putting their heads in the toilets for punishment. And HSL, a real quick backpedaled after that. It was like, their default is to defend the family. And I, I mean, I've spoke with someone who was very severe, you know, very badly abused and she, uh, they, you know, HSLDA intervened and then they got her a free pro bono local lawyer who was able to like plead down the things and, and um, you know, make the problems go away. And it's just, there is no attempt on their part to make sure the kids are okay. There's an assumption that if the parents are godly, the kids are okay. And, mm -hmm. and of course these were parents who, you know, repeat, certain things and, and, you know, you say the right words and it's like, well, then, you know, you clearly are one of the good ones. And it's, it, it's just, there's no process for actually checking that. So there's no actual concern for the children. And a piece of that is because there is an emphasis on parental rights absolutism. Yes. And uh, so let's move on to my dissertation now, because my dissertation ended up involving homeschooling um, in, in some pretty direct ways, uh, um, although mostly towards the end of it. So I wrote my dissertation on um, the history of evangelical attitudes toward public school from the 1920s through the 1980s. And what was super interesting is that in the 1920s, even though there was, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Scopes Monkey Trial, but it basically controversy over whether evolution could be taught in public schools. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, yes. That's, yeah, that's what that was. And so there was, there was controversy about that. And there were already a lot of claims by evangelicals that schools were insufficiently religious, that they needed to have prayer in them. This is something people often misunderstand is um, Engel versus Vital, which was in 1962, is the school prayer decision. And it's also often seen as like the moment prayer was removed from school. But actually, most schools did not have prayer in them in the 1920s. Um, that was largely added in the 1950s as part of the Cold War. So it was like, we are Christian America in contrast to godless atheist communism. Mm -hmm. So that's when we put God we trust on our money. That's when we made In God We Trust part of our, like our national motto. It used to be E Pluribus Unum. That's when we took In, um, in God We Trust, we, we put it in the, the Pledge of Allegiance at that point. I heard that a few weeks ago and was mind blown by so that. That's also when prayer was put in the public schools. And what's super interesting is if you look at evangelical writings in the 1950s, they're actually not super happy about having prayer in the public schools. Really? He's in it. They say that putting like the slap of religion on an otherwise already secular school day, because the rest of the school day is secular, it suggested to children that God was something that was just ancillary and not something that was foundational. Uh -huh. mm. So let's go back to the 20s. What's interesting is they were actually very much opposed to private schooling. They were huge fans of public schools, even though they were also saying public schools need to have prayer in them. Obviously, you can't teach evolution in them. We need to make that the law. They were also very much saying private schools are bad. Everyone needs to go to public school. 
And it, for a while, this kind of threw me. I was trying to figure out what was going on. Um, and I finally figured it out because I, I found some articles in the late 1940s where these people were trying to explain. And they were saying, I know, I know that forever we've been fans of public schools because, you know, someone has to Americanize all those immigrants. But hear me out. There aren't as many immigrant children anymore because in 1924, the U.S. shut its doors to most immigrants. And also the public schools are secular. So now making private Christian schools is okay. Oh my gosh. Interesting. That was going to be my follow-up question to that was like, what was the shift? And yes. that makes so much sense. So that oh was my a, gosh. There's a couple other little pieces. Cause here comes Nancy or um, Betsy DeVos. Oh boy. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so in the, um, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, a lot of Dutch Calvinists came over from the Netherlands and they settled, um, especially in Michigan, but also to a certain extent in Illinois, Iowa, um, and some other states in the general area. Um, but Michigan was sort of their headquarters. This is why you have cities in Michigan that are named things like Holland, for example. Um, a lot of Dutch Calvinist influence. Now, the thing about these Dutch Calvinists is that they had a very particular um, religious tradition. And one of their beliefs was that education should not be separated from religion ever because they argued every education communicates religious values. And their claim was that secular education communicates values by the absence of religion. Secular education communicates to students that, that religion is not relevant to, to their lives. Okay, so that was their claim. And this was not something that American evangelicals were saying at the time. At the time, American evangelicals were huge defenders of the public schools, in part because the people founding private schools were Catholics. And American Protestants were very anti-Catholic um, and very concerned about making sure that immigrants integrate into America. These American... Um, what would become eventually evangelicals at the time, the terminology was a bit different. They were... They largely sort of submerged their American identity into their Christian identity. So that even if public schools didn't teach God in their math textbooks or whatever, um, because public schools were American, see, they pledge allegiance and have flags, then they were also, to a certain extent, you know, they were acceptable as, as Christian. Um, but these Dutch Calvinists did not view it this way. So they created their own private schools. And in fact, their argument in the Netherlands before they left was that the schools should get the money from the government. The government shouldn't set up public schools. They should let anyone create schools and the money should follow the child. Does that sound familiar? It's exactly where these ideas that we have today come from. At the time, like I said, American evangelicals were completely against this because Catholics. So um, these early Dutch Calvinists had their own schools. In fact, they taught in Dutch. And this was a big problem in World War I because there was a lot of anti-foreigner sentiment. And so Dutch Calvinist schools and churches were burned. Um, after World War I, they stopped teaching in Dutch, but they still had their own schools. And they started integrating more into the American um, establishment, specifically the evangelical world. So you had, in the 1920s, you had fundamentalists. Sorry, I'm getting kind of far afield. These fundamentalists were the ones who said, we need to look at just the Bible. We need to take it literally true. And they were in opposition to what we might call liberal Christians today who were saying, God is the God of everyone. You know, like his death pays for all people's sins. Sin is a metaphor or things like this. This was very popular. So these, um, what were called at the time fundamentalists were saying, no, like Jesus literally died. He was literally born of a literal virgin. You know, the Bible is literally true. And so they started forming their own seminaries. So this is where you get Biola, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, it's where you get uh, Dallas uh, Theological Seminary, like a whole bunch of these um, in Moody Bible Institute. They started to found or to control these different institutions of um, evangelical higher education, but also the, their theological seminaries where these conversations took place. So the Dutch Calvinists started sending their people to these seminaries and they started getting jobs at these seminaries because they had enough overlap in their beliefs about literally looking at the Bible, etc., that it fit. So by the time you get to World War II, you had an, the first evangelical Christian school formed. And to form it, they reached out to the Dutch Calvinists and said, how do we do this? Because the Dutch Calvinists had a Christian school association of Dutch Calvinist schools. 
the Dutch Calvinists helped these evangelicals with the National um, Association of Evangelicals create a network of evangelical Christian schools that didn't have to be Dutch Calvinist. So already you had the idea that secular education was a problem. That was the idea that had started to invade the evangelical world from the Dutch Calvinist world. The idea that education that was secular was anti-Christian and not new. That was not something they believed before. Previously, their insistence was that you not teach something in school that's against the Bible. That's why they opposed teaching evolution. But they did not insist that every subject needed to be religious in nature. They were okay with the idea of secular schools before then. So anyway, that was, that was the big change then. And that's why in the 50s, you start having people saying, well, does it really matter if we have the Pledge of Allegiance or, or like start with prayer? Because the school curriculum itself is secular. And that's a problem. Um, so the problem is, the issue is, all this language was used in the 80s. Like public schools are atheist brainwashing factories, right? That's what they were saying in the 80s. And all these evangelical publications were saying this. This is part of a plan that communists are using. In fact, um, Tim LaHaye wrote some really fascinating things. He argued that the public schools were a plot by humanists to keep children from learning to read by not teaching them phonics and at the same time get them hooked on sex through sex education so that you would have a bunch of illiterate sex-addled people who would be right for the taking for the communists. And, and that was actually mainstream evangelical rhetoric in the 80s. That was their QAnon. It was. It really <laughs> was. But, but there's one more thing I have to say about my dissertation, and that is that the bridge to get from evangelical intellectuals saying, hey, secular education communicates to children that religion was unimportant, you have to have a bridge to get from that in the 50s to get to this sort of like, Secular brainwashing factories and tons and tons of Christian schools in the 80s. And the bridge yeah. was the desegregation of schools. Because oh even when the 50s, yes. So even though in the 50s you had serious concern among evangelical intellectuals, the evangelical ordinary people in the pews thought the schools were fine. They were fine because they, they had prayer. All the little children wore their little skirts and stood in the little lines. They used the Dick and Jane textbooks. The schools were fine. But then when they started desegregating the schools, all of a sudden the ordinary people in the pews were not okay with sending their children to public schools. They were open to the idea of sending their children somewhere else. And so oh, even though that language had already existed and the idea that secular education was perhaps... Um, communicating problematic things to our youth was already there within the evangelical academy and evangelical publications read by pastors. It wasn't until after there was a market created by desegregation for private schooling that you start to see the creation of wide scale, large scale numbers of Christian schools. Wow. Wow. You put a, you put one of the puzzle pieces in place that I've been missing in yeah. the picture for a long time because I've kind of wondered how things got from like, I kind yeah. of knew a little bit about A, nothing about B, and then was fully entrenched in C. And right. so there have been chunks between those timetables and you're like, what was the transition there? What was the catalyst for this? And what That's you're describing is what I want to know about like what the catalyst was for my parents to have bought into that and things that you've been saying about this and the, the communists um, wanting to like, make your kids like secular sex addled individuals sounds exactly like the things that my mom would say yes. growing up about this public school system. And so it's all starting to fit together a little bit better. So something it's sorry. It's important to remember that um, American evangelicals also accused Martin Luther King Jr. of being a communist. In fact, the claim was that the civil rights movement was being bankrolled by the communists and it was a communist movement. And I think about that every time today's evangelicals say that Black Lives Matter is Marxist. It's just like, oh, okay, we've been here before. Yes. I mean, I want to I wanna be clear. There were some American evangelicals who, um, <laughs> who were not against desegregation. Um, actually, Frank Gabeline was a really fascinating figure in, in early Christian schooling. He was one of those creating Christian schools in the 50s. And then he was sent by Christianity Today to cover the march at Selma. And he was so moved that he crossed the picket lines and joined the march. 
And then Christianity Today almost didn't publish the report he wrote about it because of his perspective on it. Wow. And there were people in the newsroom who said they shouldn't because they were hardcore segregationists. But I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly that publishing it was the way that prevailed and they did publish it. So there were some evangelicals who, who saw this the right way, including some who were involved in Christian schools, because like I said, Frank Gabe very involved in the Christian school movement. But that was not the perspective taken by the masses of parents who are shifting their kids to these brand new Christian schools popping up in church basements. So sometimes you have to look at a uh, distinction between the people who are sort of, um, you know, writing the magazines read by ministers and then like the people in the pews. The other thing to remember is that um, as public schools became desegregated, they found ways to talk about public schools um, in negative ways that didn't necessarily mention desegregation, but still clearly referenced it. And, and one was when they would talk about all the crime in public schools, oh, they're dangerous, or they would talk about drugs in public schools. And the thing is that public schools in the 50s had a lot of crime and drugs. I mean, juvenile delinquency was like a huge concern in the 50s, but that was before schools were desegregated. Hmm. So it looked different to these parents when you have white kids doing crime when you have black kids in the public schools and you've been taught to associate black people with crime for generations, which I think is something people today need to remember, is that in the South, these lynchings always claimed to be about protecting people from black criminals. This mm -hmm. idea that black people are criminal is what has been used to harm black people and to defend segregation for 150 years now. So this isn't like it's not a fact. <laughs> it's a lie that's been told over and over again until some people believe it like it's fact. And so when you add in, now you've got schools where it's true, there's always been some violence and drugs, but now you also have scary looking black teenagers because that's the perception. Then the, their perception changed. And I, you see this in the language. This is like, you, you really want your sweet white girl sitting in school next to, and I hate to even say this, but like a big black buck, they would say. It's just like, you people don't see that's these children. Right. Like that, People, I mean, that just sounds disgusting. The, 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 just that mindset. Um, something I'm curious about, and I, I'm, I might be completely off, but with, with all of your study, would you say nationalism kind of also intermixed with the religion at the beginning during all of those wars that were happening at that time frame, and that that's also a possible contributor to all of this? Because I feel like, you know, we've got patriotism and then we've got nationalism and every nationalist that I know is touts religion. And a lot of the religious aspects are like, um, I don't know. It's just, I, I feel like nationalism ties into it some, some way. Good question. So in the early, the first part, first half of the 20th century, this is one of the things I was trying to get at when I talked about, um, this idea that, um, being American and being Christian or, or being Protestant rather were so intertwined that if a school looked sufficiently Christian, it also felt sufficiently Protestant. So, you know, it would have its Christian or it's, it's, um, you know, American flag. It would, they would say the pledge, you know, they would, they're American. And that is something that was in the rhetoric. Like, um, you know, we want schools that are not anti-American or something. And so one thing that did change starting the sixties and seventies is that gradually uh, the 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 white man version of history and social studies in general started to be dethroned. Now it is still very much there. <laughs> it's like a long. I don't back. think it was dethroned. <laughs> no, no, no. Here, here's what I mean. You didn't have any. I don't want to say any. I would get in trouble if I say any. You really didn't have the ability for black people, for women, for Chinese people, for and I I don't you know, like immigrants, it's just been Chinese people in this country for hundreds of years. They didn't have a path into the academy. So the people who were doing history in the academy, in colleges and universities, were um, white men. So one thing you had starting in the 60s and 70s and going on into the 80s is suddenly you had black people in the academy, you had women in the academy, you had Asian Americans in the academy who started telling different stories because they were asking different questions. And so all of a sudden, American history, as looked at in the academy, started to change. And you had new stories told that were silent before, that were never looked at before. And so it is true that a lot of that history stayed largely in the academy and didn't always come into the K-12 education. But, <laughs> oh gosh, there's so much here because it's the Gablers. If you ever want to really go down a rabbit hole, look up Mel Gabler, G-A-B-L-E-R. They were in 
starting in the 60s, they started reviewing textbooks, history textbooks especially, but any textbooks used in public schools. And they claimed it was because they saw anti-American things in their child's textbook, their son's textbook. So they start reviewing textbooks from all over and they put out tracts. And it was, this stuff is like, this is what it was before this stuff went around on Facebook groups, okay? You know, the same <laughs> shopping sharing on Facebook, this was shared in like for bulletins and like mailers and... And it was all about how the textbooks had become anti-Americanism and they're teaching. And it was generally because they were teaching America wasn't perfect in tiny ways. And that was seen as a problem. And so, uh, you know, textbooks that really address slavery or that really address social problems or that really treated unions in a way that wasn't just like a grand, grand patriotic sort of thing. Like, God uh, forbid we be honest about what happened. Although guys, I'm going to insert here that, Trump just made an announcement about schools and it sounds very reminiscent of everything you're just saying right there, Rachel. So that that's real scary. No, none of it is. And, and the, um, the Texas textbook commission ended up with a bunch of people on it specifically who ran to try to get our textbooks um, are properly American. And this was back in the day. So you have these great, I think I have a book that's called like the textbook wars. So this was going on too. So there's also a perception that the public schools are no longer sufficiently patriotic and sufficiently American because they're teaching criticisms of the country. And it's like, well, maybe we don't live in a utopia. Have you considered? Um, so, so all of these things, they started seeing the public schools in a negative light um, for like this sort of collection of reasons. But one of the things I thought was very interesting um, when I read some of these evangelical publications is that they would publish dissenting views and they would publish articles from time to time by people who said, look, if we take our kids out of the public schools, then, you know, all these kids who need a Christian influence don't have that anymore. You know, if you keep your kids in the school, then invite their friends over or see if you can go. One of this was fascinating. Find out if you can go read aloud to the kids in the school while the teacher is reading, you know, working with other kids. This is a thing parents could do and sometimes still can. And they were like, pick a book like the Chronicles of Narnia, you know, and that way you're, you're getting these, Christian themes in there. And so there were p some people who were saying the public schools are not as bad as you're making them out. And if we're not there, the salt and light is gone. Aren't we supposed to be the salt and light? So that was interesting too. It wasn't like it was complete agreement, but the focus on these problematic changes pushed a lot of people to, into both Christian schools and homeschooling. Um, Christian schools the problem with Christian schools was they didn't always exist everywhere that people needed them to. And the other problem, you know, so some of the parents homeschooled because there wasn't a good Christian school. The other issue is that um, some of these people were people who believed that women really should be in the home. And if it was to send your three kids to a Christian school, you would have to get your wife to get a job. You know? Now, is this around the era? Are, are we back in the fifties now? Well, we're in the eighties. Okay. Okay many Christian schools in the 50s, not evangelical Christian schools. There was only a handful because people still saw the public schools as being theirs. Okay. White evangelical Protestants saw the public schools as being theirs, the ones in the pews did. And so by the 80s, they no longer see the public schools as theirs, in part because the public schools now belong to more people than just them. Mm -hmm. um, and so many of them enrolled in Christian schools. Christian schools became very big in the 70s and 80s. Then homeschooling really began in the 80s. There were some people in the 70s who were homeschooling, very small numbers. Um, it really began in the 80s, um, in part because, you know, there weren't necessarily Christian schools everywhere that people wanted to have their child have a Christian education, but also because if you homeschooled, the, the mother could be at home with her children, which was where these, many of these evangelicals felt mothers should be. Mm -hmm. So that's when you really had the rise of Christian homeschooling was in the 80s. And by the end of the 80s, some estimates say that 90% of homeschoolers were homeschooling for religious reasons. Now, worth noting, there always was a progressive left to the homeschool movement, um, sometimes known as unschoolers, um, sometimes called the hippie homeschoolers. And they were people who were anti-establishment in because they felt that children in public schools were being sort of, um, I would say dumbed down, but it was really more about like this idea of setting children free from schools. And they would sometimes say that children should not really be segregated away from real life, that schools created a, a paradigm that was sort of fake and that children should learn by doing. So you had this sort of progressive left and they tended to speak in the language of children's rights, whereas the uh, right tended to speak in the language of uh parental rights. So one of the things that happened 
happened in the 80s. In the early 80s, most school districts let people homeschool if they would just come to them and say, I want to homeschool. Here's what I get to do. I can bring them back and have them tested at the end of the year. Can I try this? Most school districts were okay with that originally because the people who were doing this, these like especially progressive left homeschoolers, frequently had a higher education. You know, they had thought this through um, and they sounded like reasonable, rational people. I want to try this different way of educating. Then in the 80s, you started to have an increasing number of parents who were coming to the schools and saying, I'm going to teach my kids myself. I don't care what you say. God gave my kids to me. Your school is a brainwashing factory to atheism. I don't have to tell you anything. And all of a sudden, a lot of these school administrators were no longer as willing to let people homeschool because these people kind of sounded crazy. Mm-hmm. So that was what some uh, homeschoolers at the time called the look over your shoulder time because all of a sudden it became a lot more iffy to homeschool. And that's why you then get a lot of the states uh, in the late 80s creating homes get harder for them to just homeschool because they were concerned. Um, so, um, so the other thing I want to talk about is you were talking about different kinds of homeschoolers and whether that's changed. And it absolutely is the case that in the past two decades, um, and perhaps especially in the last decade, an increasing number of people have homeschooled um, for totally ordinary reasons. And there's there's a scholar who works on homeschooling who I've actually met at some conferences, Milton Geither, who his argument was that homeschooling began in the 70s and 80s as a political protest movement. The people on the left were protesting, you know, against these ideas about schooling, and they had ideological reasons for doing so. The people on the right, you know, were protesting against ideas about, like, what was being taught or how. And, you know, again, this was ideological reasons. And he argued that that is what made homeschooling in that period in the modern era different from homeschooling in, say, 1820. We don't Mm -hmm. usually use the term homeschooling for when a kid, you know, just learned to read by the side of their mom at the, you know, fireplace or whatever. And that's because it was just a way to educate your child. Children were educated in many ways. But that now homeschooling had become a movement of political protest. However, he also posited that as more parents start to homeschool for totally ordinary reasons, and as homeschooling becomes recognized as just another way to educate your children, that that will actually change. Because now it's not a political protest. It's just a way to educate your kids. Right. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. And I think it's very much very true. And I think one of the things that has changed between today and the 80s is we live in an era of school choice. We live in an era where instead of assuming that your friend's kids go to their local public school when they're old enough, you may ask your friend where they're going to send them to school because there are so many options. Right. So that I think is part of why homeschooling has become increasingly seen as a, just a, a way to educate your kids. And thus more people have turned to it who don't have any political protests. There's nothing like that pushing it to them to it. Um, they're just interested in it as an educational method. So that is something that is changing. I would estimate that about half of homeschoolers still have religious motivations. Mm-hmm. Um, and they often still control those state homeschool groups in part because homeschooling is so much more a part of their identity. It isn't always a part of someone's identity if they're homeschooling their kid because they faced bullying in sixth grade and they're going to homeschool them and then try putting them in high school and see if that's better. So, and that's super interesting to me because, you know, we are seeing a little bit of a shift these days and not just because of COVID, but um, I think one of my big questions is because of the grip that the evangelical movement has had on homeschooling for so long, do you feel like people like Homeschool Legal Defense Association in relation to your coalition, do you, who do you find to be the most difficult or like the roadblocks for change because to change like they they're standing in front of it you what is it that you guys um as a result of all of all of these things and all of your study like through the coalition you're you want to kind of change these things for kids so who are the biggest purveyors of like obstinance to change and making it difficult for actual laws to be enacted i really wish i could just say that it was just hslda I really wish I could. HSLDA is a very big roadblock. And um, for all of their saying on their website, you know, you should have your child with disabilities get an IEP. 
if a state were to introduce a law saying that every parent homeschooling a child with disabilities needs to submit their IEP, you know, just proof that they've created one, HSLDA would fight it tooth and nail. They believe that every measure of accountability or, or any requirement, it should all just be voluntary. Um, and that parents should be given complete free reign. The only requirement they are sometimes okay with, but not even always, is a notification requirement. But if you try to introduce a notification requirement in a state that doesn't already have it, they'll still oppose it. They oppose any form of accountability or protection for child children whatsoever. However, it is not just HSLDA that's the problem. It is also our nation's approach to parenting and to children and the idea that they have rights. Mm -hmm. We were, um, I, I know somebody went in and lobbied with some of the local, um, you know, state reps at her, her state house. This was back in 2014. And this one state legislator told her, state legislator told her parents have the right to mess up their kids for the first 18 years of their life. And then, then, then kids can make their own decisions. But the first 18 years of their lives, you know, parents just get to mess them up. And he didn't use the word mess. He used another word. And so it's just, <laughs> it, it's frustrating. And so it's a, it's a mindset that can very easily affect perfectly ordinary homeschooling parents. It's this idea that parents know best. Parents always know best what's right for their children. No one else should tell me what to do with my own children. The idea that you would ask your child what kind of education they want to get is like anathema. It's like, they're my kid. I make the decisions. And the other part of the problem is while there are many, many perfectly wonderful homeschooling parents, there really are. Yes, yes. They really want to support what we're doing. It is also the case that homeschooling attracts controlling, manipulative parents. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it offers a level of control that they cannot have if their child attends public school. Let, let me give you an example. And this also helps explain why some school districts have negative attitudes toward homeschoolers. My own local school district, on the first day of school last year, there was a parent in the office who wanted to go to her child's kindergarten class and sit in on the first day of kindergarten. She was told that is not allowed. What you do is you come in with your child to the gym, you shake your child's teacher's hand, you let them get in the line, and then you wave as they all go in their lines to their classrooms. It would be disruptive. To have a parent in the classroom, the teacher's trying to create norms for the classroom. We don't, they don't do that. They have, um, you know, an open house earlier in the year, but you don't get to go in with your kid on the first day of kindergarten. This parent was so mad, she was in the office screaming at the principal. They brought the social worker to try to help talk her down. She screamed at the social worker. And one of the things she started screaming was that if they didn't let her go sit in with her kid on her first day of school, she was going to pull her kid out of school and homeschool her. <laughs> that is just not, it's not... Wow. It's a problem. So if you have a parent, there are some parents who start to homeschool because they had very real problems with school districts that the school district was absolutely in the wrong. But there are also parents who at the slightest piece of disagreement with the school district, they pull their kids to homeschool. And a piece of that is control. And it's frustrating because it means that you do have a certain number of parents who homeschool who want to control and are trying to control every element of their child's life. And that's not not super helpful. So again, no. it's exactly what we, we had an experience with. And our mom, I remember being a baby and um, my two oldest siblings, they went to school um, for like, uh, I think a few years and my mom drove the school bus. And so since she was driving the school bus, I was in a car seat there in the school bus or whatever. And then at some point, like, I don't know what happened, that shift and that disconnect from them being in school. I don't know when my parents became a part of this really, really kind of Holdish. fringy, um, non-denominational church. And after that happened, everybody was out of school and we were all homeschooled and mom had to quit all, all work. So there was that shift in time and it had everything to do with control. Both of my parents are, are, are clearly in that subset, but I just want to know what they were being told by this group that they were in that made them so frightened. I can, I, I think we've talked about a lot of those reasons here, but, um, it, it is really scary. Just that knee jerk reaction of just fear so, so here's, I think, a part of it. A part of it is the approach to government and the way they view government. Government is just the sum total of us. We elect the government. Like, it is not some scary other that is out there. But in this country in particular, we have a very 
antagonistic view towards governments uh, by many people. And this is not necessarily the case in other countries. So, um, <laughs> And, and the approach to children's rights is what is so different too. When I was, I was in the UK um, last summer. No, I mean, not the one we just finished because nobody went anywhere. The previous. <laughs> um, and the place I stayed was right by a primary school. And I looked at the messaging on the outside of the school and I was like, oh, that looks interesting. And I looked the school up and I found out that it has a designation as a rights respecting school. What? What is that? So it turns out that in the UK, if you explicitly teach the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child to the children and explicitly work on um, helping them to actualize and realize their rights under that convention in various collaborative ways, you can get a designation as a rights respecting school. It's, you know, it's like a, just like a school might be like, it's a STEM Amazing. school has an extra huh. program. Um, and I just was floored because that was the, it's public schools. We would not, I can't even imagine if a public school started trying to teach the children, like all the rights, like children, these are your rights. People freak out because public schools teach children that they have the right not to have their body touched in ways that make them uncomfortable. That's the only thing we do for actually teaching kids rights. And that's a part of comprehensive sex education. And it's like, we don't in this country believe that children have rights independent from their parents. To the extent that we do believe they have rights, it is only care rights. They have the right to be cared for. It is never empowerment rights. They have the right to access information. They have the right to make up their own mind. They have the right to access transportation. Like these are things that are in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. They have the, the right to form their own beliefs. This is not something we believe about children at all. It yeah, is To me, it seems like a sense of parental ownership instead of stewardship. Which Well, and one way I put it is parents... As opposed to parents' rights, I wish we talked about parental responsibilities. Yes. Yeah. Like the parent has a responsibility to make sure their child is fed and clothed and all these things, but also the responsibility to, to make sure that they have the freedom. And homeschooling parents say, nobody should check in on my kid because I know my kid is right. I, mean, my, I know my kid is fine. And I, what they don't, and like, I try to tell them, one of the things I try to tell them is, you may know your child is fine, but you don't know that the other 2 million children being homeschooled are fine. Like you, right. you, but the other piece of it is, even if you know your children are fine, your children have rights that are independent from you. Well, yes. that, and we also forget that the first several years of a child's life is really what sets the foundation for what they carry with them for the rest of their life. And as a community, the government, society, we should all be collectively concerned of what's happening to each kid because their experiences in that chunk of time with the parents deciding what's best for them could set up failure for society in the future because they're not prepared, they're not adequate, adequately set up to be functioning adults um, with appropriate education, um, etc. So I feel like that's also a disconnect too is um is just forgetting that this is going to affect everybody as well if you don't want to focus on that child then think of yourself or your kids how are they going to be affected by the evolving society based upon people just doing whatever they want to their and julia like just to bounce off of that one thing that really 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 stands out to me and and rachel i have like so many things that i want to talk about like with you there's <laughs> just not enough time seriously no. <laughs> but one thing i i think is important that my my idea has been formulated by the idea that in our communities that I grew up in, um, pro-life is, I mean, I, I understand everybody has their own rights to believe whatever they want, but the concept of being pro-life um, makes it to where all life is precious until that child is born. And then all of a sudden, it, everything falls apart and there's nothing, nothing left. It's like we these communities don't mind. They love war and sending their kids off for the military and all of this patriotic stuff. But the minute that child is born and they have this unique opportunity to shape a really beautiful life, then you have families like we grew up in the Quiverful movement, where it's all about having as many children as possible to, you know, populate God's army. And with that being said, I don't see how it's possible, you know, just from our experience, and you had more children in the house than we did, we were one of, you know, six, is 
the idea that um, you have as many kids as possible. And then these kids, they don't have their own identities. It's like the older kids have to help raise the younger ones. And then somehow, just like the Duggar family, you have the mom who's homeschooling all these kids. And I'm like, there is no way that this mom has enough time in the day to teach every single grade level to these kids. How is that even considered legal? It's like, there's so many things that I'm wondering at this day and age, how it still slips under the radar this way. And And then just real quick (laughs) to tack onto that. How do we have people that have to go to school to become educators? They have to be educated to be an educator. They have to be like qualified, but then people are allowed to just take their kids out of school and teach them without no qualifications. How, how is that okay? <laughs> so these are some really great questions. And one of the things that um, homeschooling parents is, will often say to respond to this, and, I, and it's often like the more conservative homeschooling parents, not every homeschooling parent, is that, um, you know, they're only teaching a few kids. So it's not the same as a teacher who has like 25 kids. And they'll also then say that most education that teachers get is just crowd control. So it doesn't apply when you're teaching your own children um, and that parents know their children best. So the problem with these claims is there's several problems. One is the point that you made, Kelly, about teaching like six different children in six different grade levels. No teacher does that. You know, a teacher only has to know one set of standards and curriculum and they teach it to all the kids and they have to tailor it, but they're not dealing with six different grade levels. So the idea that that is easier because they're only teaching six kids and not 25 is is simply false. Um, The other issue is that it is simply not true that most of what teachers learn is crowd control. So one of the things we do, and I realized that because we got into my dissertation, we sort of skipped the founding of of my organization, CRHE. Can we talk again? (laughs) (laughs) We we, we, because we didn't even get into the education uh, other than the study. So we should definitely have another conversation. But let me finish this thought out because um, we founded CRHE to advocate for children who are homeschooled because we felt like none of the other organizations out there were advocating for the children. They were advocating generally for the parents. And on the other side of things, you have the teachers unions that would maybe come and argue for this or that requirement, but they weren't arguing, advocating for homeschooled children either. They tend to be anti-homeschooling in part because it is true that homeschooling sort of is a, is a threat to them. So um, there was nobody there advocating for the children specifically, which is why we founded CRHE. But we are in the midst of creating a, a whole suite of new resources for homeschooling parents. Because one of the things that we've seen in recent years is an increasing number of parents who contacted us saying, hey, I want to homeschool my kids. I really need to. Often they have, you know, bullying or other issues with the schools, but I don't even know where to start and I don't feel qualified. And here's the thing. That's the right response. That's the right way to approach homeschooling is with an awareness of what you don't know. Yeah. And one of the things we want to do is help those parents and say, here is some good quality information. Because unfortunately, there's a lot of information out there in the homeschool world that is riddled with things that are just not good, not helpful. For example, many online homeschool, you know, various resources and groups, they'll claim it's fine if a kid doesn't learn to read until they're 10 because every child is different. And when they want to learn to read, they will learn to read. Mm. That's nonsense. Mm. If your child is approaching 10, if they're eight and they can't read, in fact, um, eight is usually sort of the year in schools where it's like they need to be reading by eight. So K through 12, they're trying to learn to read, and then third through fifth, they read to learn. So if they get to third grade and they can't read, there's probably a reason for that. So these groups really should be encouraging parents to look for things like learning disabilities, or maybe it's just that they haven't been teaching reading very well. (laughs) Maybe they need to go learn how to teach reading in other ways. Mm -hmm. But your response to that should not be, oh, but when a kid wants to learn to read, he will. That's not good. So there's so much information out there that's just not good information. And it's mixed in with a lot of other information that's good. But a new homeschooling parent doesn't necessarily know how to sort through all of that. And so we're trying to create a suite of resources that really encourages parents. And we also have a course that we're offering for new homeschooling parents where we walk them through these things, really encourages them to see themselves as professional educators, to learn what curriculum really is. It's amazing. I posted a link to that, by the way, in an article, just because I think that's super important. Super important. That information isn't out there. And one of the things that we encourage parents to do is look at what is taught in teachers' colleges, just so that you know what teachers are required to know. And if there's something in there that you're like, I don't know that at all, maybe you should learn. And it doesn't necessarily mean you need to take a course, but maybe you would benefit from um, getting a teaching textbook or there's all sorts of resources available. But knowing what educators are expected to know, like these sorts of things, um, 
is not something that homeschooling um, groups often promote because so many of them have this idea that parents just automatically know things. And so that's where the parents contacting us are like, help. <laughs> no, we, we, that's not the case. Um, what, what would you say um, the first success story was? Because like uh, we've, we've talked a lot about some, you know, the background and everything, but to like kind of get even deeper into what you have created, what is what is one of the biggest, like the first success story that, that you can recall that kind of like further motivated, you know, your purpose and your mission? Um, so we interact with a lot of individuals who contact us and sometimes they do respond and say, Hey, you know, thank you. Like um, I was able to, to, um, you know, use your information and, and get kids out of a situation, but a lot of that we don't necessarily know, you know, or, or track what happened later. One thing that we can point to is we did get um, help get a law changed in Georgia um, just a year and a half ago. And it was a very small change. But what it did in, in Georgia, you are required to fill out a form when you start to homeschool. You fill it out with the state. But the state never told the school districts if that form got filled out. So a school district was the family would just tell the school district that they were going to homeschool. And then if they never filled out the form, no one knew. And so there was a, a really um, horrific abuse case that happened in, in, you know, one of these cases where they told the school they were homeschooling but never filled out the form. And so now the law says that the school, the state notifies the school district anytime a form is filled out by a family in their district so that they know who's being homeschooled. And also the law states if a family withdraws to homeschool and they don't get the thing from the state saying they filled out the form within 45 days, Child Protective Services has to go in and check out the situation and see what happened. Um, If we have another conversation, I can talk a lot about the research on these. There's this problem with kids falling through the cracks where it has nothing to do with parents who chose to homeschool out of like maybe good or mixed motivations and then things didn't necessarily go well. It has to do with families that are dysfunctional and abusive from the beginning, realizing that they can use homeschooling to get out of um, anyone, you know, checking in on their kids at all. So these are cases where um, parents will start to homeschool after a child protective service case ends so that a teacher will not call in another report, um, including really horrific situations. And so anyway, so the, getting that bill change, it's a small change, but it is a change. And, and, an actual positive change that has the potential to help. It's a building block. I mean, and it has a ripple effect. Like that small change is going to affect so many people. And then it's just the first step of many. Um, Something Kelly and I've discussed before is having you come back on like as like a partnership almost because, because an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, is not enough time or like we're not even skimming the surface because there's so many valuable questions you have so much information and just the amount of impact you've had your experiences your studies like this is extremely and valuable to and back off of that we want to be a big part of of pushing for legislative change yes. and changes that will put in those protections for children, because we've used both you, your site and your sister's site, the invisible children yes. to cover a couple of cases like Christiana Glenn or um, Joseph Hall. And I want to just keep going through these cases, good and bad, the abused or when the homeschooler becomes the abuser or, and, and just kind of go through what can go wrong, what we can do. And it's like, if you've ever been a child, which we all have, this, this involves you because yeah. you as a child, you, you didn't have, you may have had a great upbringing. Like yours seems to be nothing like you, you were taught, you at least were taught. I don't know anything else about it, but that's more than a lot of these kids in these stories can say. And we have to be the ones as adults to not just drop the ball. And I love the fact that you've, you've started this really important yes. work and there is so much to do, but Julie and I are like, how do we put our, this into action? How do yeah. we become a positive change and help yes, we others can talk all day, but like, where is it actually going to make a difference? So a, co- a couple of real quick notes. Um, and one is, uh, we did, we talked a lot about, you know, Christian homeschoolers and a lot about problems. Um, and really we've discussed the history of homeschooling today. So if we do it again, we could discuss the research on homeschooling. Um, but I do want to emphasize that homeschooling can work and it can work well. And I think when it yeah. works, well, 
It's when it consciously works to empower children. And that's one of the things we're trying to make central in the new resources that we're creating for homeschooling parents is encouraging them to be familiar with the idea that children have rights and to see their homeschooling as a way of empowering their kids um, and to actually put that into practice. So if you have a child who says they want to attend public high school, even if that wasn't your plan, you know, put them in the driver's seat on that. You've got the kids have to be more important in their own education than your feelings mm -hmm. in so many cases, you know, so that, that's something we really promote. Um, as for uh, how to actually create change, and I, I would note that I, I agree that we as people who were homeschooled have a responsibility to try to improve the lives of kids being homeschooled now and in the future. And that's really so much of why I was involved in founding CRHE. Um, we are founded by homeschool alumni. We are run by homeschool alumni. Um, we have some volunteers and, and people who weren't homeschooled, but they've all had touch, you know, with homeschooling in some ways. Um, and it's, you know, most of us were. So how to help. Um, one of the things, I hate to be sort of sound craven, but, you know, it, fundraising for CRHE. So if you're listening and you're someone who donates a lot of money to different causes, because some people do, they're blessed enough to have that sort of resources, we very much need the funding. The HSLDA and all the other groups that oppose what we're doing get so much more funding than we have. We operate on very limited resources on a shoestring. We do a lot with, with what we get, but we need more. And I am happy to speak with anyone who's interested in donating larger amounts, um, smaller amounts. You know, one of the things we need is monthly donors. If you mm -hmm. could sign up to give $20 a month, you have no idea how much of a difference that means. That oh, yeah. is huge. So, you know, you may be looking at this being like, I can't give $500. $20 a month is just as good. Like, see, yeah. seriously. Um, so you can go over to our website. We've got a donate tab and you can also contact us um, on, again, that's on our website. I'd be happy to talk um, with you about what we do. We have um, our, our annual plans we put out. So we're very transparent about what we do with the funding, what we've accomplished, so we can get you all that as well. The other thing is just being aware and speaking with your lawmakers, one of the most challenging things about this whole situation is that whenever a law comes up, the people who know and care and are there at the Capitol are homeschooling parents. HSLDA whips them into a frenzy and then has them all turn out. Mm -hmm. And they tell them, there, there was a bill in Michigan, this just bored me, the Michigan bill would have required homeschooled children to be seen by a mandatory reporter at least twice a year. And all the mandatory reporter would have had to do is fill out a form saying, I saw the kids. The reason for this was there were these children who died and uh, their mother killed them and put them in their bodies in a freezer. And nobody knew they were missing for years because there was no school to report that they stopped attending. And so they just were missing. And Ooh. for years, you can homeschool dead children in most every state. So oh my God. You can homeschool dead children. Therefore, what this law said was, or would have said, it didn't pass, is just that each semester, your child has to be seen by somebody, that somebody has to fill out a form, and then you can, you know, turn that in. And the thing is, in, in the state of Michigan, a mandatory reporter includes a dentist, a doctor, a teacher, a minister, like, so many people, you know, if you had the most unthreatening types of people, right? your pastor can fill out a form twice a year. The point is to make sure your child is alive. This is not hard. And yet, HSLDA was like, this is the biggest threat to homeschooling Michigan has seen in 20 years. They're going to they're gonna try to ban homeschooling, basically. And it's just like, how did you get from, you need to show your kids are alive, to like, they're trying to ban homeschooling. It's absurd. And the thing we is- We need to bring common sense back into this. Common right? sense, not threats. <laughs> another bill, there was a bill in, I got so many of these stories, there's a, but I'll just, I'll, I'll leave you with this one. There was a bill in Hawaii, and it would have required a background check for families to start to homeschool, just to make sure you have not committed a crime against the children, you know, mm -hmm. or that you don't have a concerning history of child abuse and neglect. So if you don't have those things. Nothing will happen. So it's just a background check. 1,000 homeschooling parents showed up to the Capitol at the hearing to protest it. The lawmakers involved in it pulled it immediately after the hearing. And one of them said this quote, there must be something wrong with this bill that I didn't realize because so many people showed up. There's clearly something's wrong with it. So we need to take it back to the drawing board. And it's like, no, or no, maybe. And so it's just frustrating because the only people, if you pulled the whole state of Hawaii and you said, do you think people should be allowed to homeschool if they have a concerning history of child abuse and neglect or crimes against children. You would get at least 90% of people, probably a lot more, saying, no, they should not. And yet, this 
relatively small relative to the population of the state group of homeschooling parents gets to dictate what the policy is based on their fear mongering because That's disturbing and that shows me that they're okay with somebody with that past doing that that is so disturbing well, well and justify that be saying that well what if somebody was wrongfully accused and it's like well the bill didn't say that anyone who ever has a report ever like there's a difference between um you know you had an unfounded report and like a convictions children were removed actual from the- convictions oh, right i mean that should be the simplest thing there was if you haven't done the story of imani moss you should she was in georgia her mother was on probation after pleading guilty to child abuse of her and was allowed to pull her out and homeschool her immediately after a child abuse report regarding her, which was deemed unfounded because welts are allowed in the state of Georgia. And so it's like, Um, there's so many red flags. First of all, she should not have been allowed to homeschool at all because she had a past child abuse conviction. But second of all, she just had a child abuse report. If somebody reports a family for child abuse and then they withdraw to homeschool the next week, there should be questions. Yeah. Like, especially because it was a teacher that made that, rep- it's just like, and, 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 and she was starved to death and her body, they tried to get rid of it by burning it and by melting it in acid and ultimately left it in the trash cans in pieces. So like this oh, beautiful oh my God. girl, and, and, and yeah, so these are the sorts of bills that HSLDA and, and the homeschooling families that support them are opposing. And it is, I really wish, and, and maybe we'll get there eventually. I wish these people would come to the table with us. Because yeah. I, say yes if you have a concern about somebody getting caught up in this that shouldn't be let's talk about how we can make sure that whatever bills we create catch the bad cases and don't prevent good families from homeschooling let's have that conversation yeah i feel like a lot of that that kind of reaction like the 1000 that you were saying that small percentage that showed up i feel like those the, those people that type of group of people that prevent the common sense laws from happening to protect the child i feel like they are largely misinformed and um and a really good aspect of like what uh our purpose could be is bringing that awareness in having those conversations because there's no way that they'd be okay with that right you would hope (laughs) like where are they getting their information have has there been fear-mongering which is just giving them tunnel vision and they refuse to see anything else like do so we obviously need to bring way more awareness to this side of the topic um I, I i anything to help communicate that oversight is not a threat to homeschooling it's actually a boon is positive this is thing i something i don't think people realize one of the reasons that homeschooling can get a negative stereotype is because of cases like the turpins out in california where they found those 11 children mm-hmm. you know emaciated their growth stunted because they'd been starved for years so when you say homeschooling and people think of the turpins or the heart children whose parents if you haven't done them you should do them whose parents drove them off a cliff and killed them all in california um they were from they'd been in oregon and, and washington before that you know people think of these cases when they hear homeschooling if you created laws that prevented homeschooling from being used to abuse and harm children and actually created some accountability for homeschooling, actually the reputation of homeschooling would increase. People yeah. would think you're a nutter if you homeschool. So actually, um, I, I heard this uh, woman in New York City speak once. I thought this was really fascinating. She was a homeschooling parent and was interviewed um, for a story that had to do with oversight. She said that she supports the kind of oversight they have in New York City, which is among the most oversight in the country. It still has a lot of holes, which we can talk about later. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it is a lot more than other states have. And she said she supports it because it makes people look at her family better. Because That's awesome. That's a really great point of view. You know, I love that. Kids, you know, in this flat in New York City, and they're just at home all the time. And when she explains to people that she's homeschooling and she has to turn in quarterly progress reports and have the kids tested each year and she has to teach XYZ subjects and here's such a, like, then they're like, oh, okay. And they see her as a professional who knows what she's doing with checks and yeah. balances. They don't assume the worst. So oversight actually has the potential to improve the image of homeschooling parents and the experience and potentially to open up more doors for um, involvement in things within the school districts as well, like extracurricular, like anything to sort of bring this together. And it's just, we need to foster a more positive approach to oversight. And I think that would really help. I think what you're kind of even um, pointing out is the fact that this group of people that are so scared, they're like a flock of scared sheep when it's not a wolf coming into their mixed. 
it's a midst, it's a, it's a black sheep with different thoughts and that is okay. But what the black sheep is trying to say is that you, what you're doing is good and we're not against it. We're not trying to stop you being white sheep. You, you be white sheep, you know, but like, let's have some common sense here. Let's meet in the middle. Let's, let's make it to where this is a more positive experience for everyone. And I think that threat, they feel like that, that you just want to take something away from them. It's like, it's this knee jerk reaction where I think like HSLDA is like the NRA of, of like the evangelical movement. Like they, and really, I don't see any proof where that's found. Those fears are founded at all. I feel like and so, and and that's what's also crazy is like those fears are so they're they're deep set, but like I feel like many of them are very unfounded. You know what I would say though, it, we're not we're not a black sheep coming in. We're the farmer trying to build a fence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they're trying yeah. to go over the cliff, and we're like, hold on, come back. I don't want you to die here. Come back. Don't jump off the cliff. And they're like, let us do what we want. <laughs> nipping at it keep, let us build the fence and keep you safe yeah. god forbid <laughs> exactly and and that's the the important part is like whatever in in the future we would like to discuss with you further like in in my state of colorado or where julia is in florida what what kind of actions are are you know going to the floor what are um what are things that we can go actively participate in to push legislation and, and help this conversation and maybe help be some kind of mediator. Um, that that's our goal. And, and we really appreciate the fact that you, you've started this and it's yes. so positive. You're it's a champion. Amazing. You're a champion for these kids yeah. and and our future community, our future societies. That's just so powerful. One of the things we're trying to do also is create state chapters. And this is a, a very, um, at a very baby stage in the process, but the goal is to have um, a state chapter in each state that has three, at least three active involved homeschool alumni. And so um, the homeschool alumni in that state chapter would do a number of things. Um, they would help monitor what's going on in the legislature. They would meet with the lawmakers in that state. And they would also help with speaking to media. We'd help mediate media opportunities um, in that state. And so it really would help us have feet on the ground at different places. Because you know where I am in Illinois, I don't necessarily know what's going on right at the second in you know utah so that's one of the things we're working on doing so if either of you are interested or other people who are listening we actually have a form on our website um for interest in helping to create a chapter and it, again it's in the beginning stages but we really think that having local people on the ground is going to have, be helpful because yes. then you guys can meet with lawmakers you guys can speak at things you know yes it's, i i mean that's i feel yeah. so strongly about that and i will be filling out that form ASAP because it's like I spent my whole life. And I mean, you, you read the, the testimonial, you know, a little bit about it, but you know, coming from being a cripplingly shy person who's scared of absolutely everyone um, to kind of just being like, no, this isn't acceptable. Like the world isn't as scary as we were told it was. And, and let's just make it like, I just don't know why there's such pushback for positive like love, care, and empathy. And I, that to me, I feel like should drive all of us, especially the homeschooling community, because if that is kind of what, you know, if you are religious, what you're, you're founded upon, like loving others and, and, you know, caring, like that is what we are supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be stewards of this world and regardless of what your belief is. And I think it's so important that you've taken it seriously yes. And um, yeah, everybody listening, please do get involved in any way you can and donate. And, you know, like Jillian, and I don't have a ton of money, but we do like to give to causes that are important to us. And so that is, I think, a huge, huge step if you can't, yeah, you know, I meet with your legislators. We have some $5 monthly donors who have been giving to us for years. So like, it doesn't have to be $20. Like, it, right. <laughs> it really does help. Well, Rachel, thank you so much. I know we've taken up a lot of your time, but we would like to take up more of your time yes, in the future. We, would. we really like, would. <laughs> Julie and I did a whole, um, I wrote a piece and then we did a whole section on right after Christiana Glenn covering that, um, just talking about social services and, and just what's crippling that in, it, in and of itself. Um, we can't fix a broken system unless we know all the pieces of the puzzle. And you put a lot of those pieces together for us today. And I, I think there's yeah. so much more 
to, you know, kind of explain this situation to people who maybe were never homeschooled and, and don't really know anything about it. Um, I think that's important is to reach those people who, who may not know and are like, what? Didn't even know this was a thing. So yeah, yeah there've been a lot of people who have heard our story and have thought it's like an anomaly and it's not. And it's not even the worst of what's happened. So but the positive thing is that we we um we grew up with a, a homeschool family that was a lot like the the progressive kind of left leaning one that you were talking yes. about, and both of the the siblings reached out to us and were like, you know, we're so sorry to hear about your experience. Our parents didn't homeschool us for religious reasons, and they were so supportive. And they're like, we saw a lot so of this. Intelligent, like they were. They were raised well. They're very socially aware and conscious. And they, one of them's like a professor. I actually think I think both of them are in education. Uh, and their parents are education. wonderful. Like, you know, it, wonderful. there's no, there there are these really good success stories, and I yes. want to like highlight those. And you know he recommended this other podcast called Straight White American Jesus. And we're uh, going to be interviewing Brad Onishi next week from it. And he kind of, their, their podcast is all about the evangelical movement and its roots and, and, you know, from the beginning in the U S to like now, and they cover everything they talk about. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. I remember this. I, this is yes, yeah, spot on. And they're professors. And it's just so neat to finally be hearing these conversations that like, I just thought we were the only ones yeah. who, who had seen or experienced this. One thing we tell people is that they have no idea how much of an impact they can have on the life of a child who's being homeschooled in a bad situation. Yeah. And we actually have several resources on our website specifically for people who may know someone in a situation like that. And maybe in some cases calling Child Protective Services is appropriate depending on what's going on. But in other cases, it's just a sucky situation and there's nothing actually, you know, legally going on, but it's, it's you know, not a great situation. And we really encourage people to think about how they can be, make an impact in that child's life. And it doesn't, like you're saying with this family, you know, like it doesn't take that much to make that impact. And that's going to be so powerful. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for your time. Once again, we'll, we'll stay in touch, but um, we won't take up any more of your, your Saturday. Um, but this has this been has really been great. Super insightful. Yeah. And like Julie and I were just sitting there like, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. I was just telling someone else, uh, one of my colleagues, I talked to a lot of reporters and, and they frequently will finish by being like amazed at how much I know. And then I feel like, only some pieces are going to be quoted. And she was like, well, you know, you really should do more podcasting. And then you can actually say, all yeah, these you, yeah, you should. You, <laughs> you absolutely should. And, and Julie and I were talking about, um, and we, we don't have to include this in, in it at all, you know, just because we, we can edit, but um, we, we really do mean it, Rachel, that we, we would like whatever you guys see a need, we want to help whether that like I've got links to all of your pages, I write pieces and I try and link things in because I do, I feel it is so important, even though I'm never going to have kids, I still know that there are so many invisible kids out there and somebody's got to tell their story. And, you know, we we're trying to go through as many of the stories in the invisible children list as possible to just do dive in and do some more research and then see where it is now. And it's, it's so important that um, we help change some of these, these laws. So if there is like a state representative that we can, we can be ambassadors for, we, we want to help in any way, shape or form. Um, so whether, whatever you need anything on our site that we can link to yours, um, I linked your, um, your teacher, you know, kind of beginning of school, kind of, uh, here's some good resources just because I don't think there's enough of that out there. And so I think that that's, um, that's something we feel very strongly about. We're also going to be like working on getting some merchandise created and kind of put that on the page. And we wanted to have like a portion of those profits go to you guys as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys so much. We, this is the sort of thing that keeps us going. We, we need this sort of energy. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you so much again. Yes, um, thank you. We'll stay in touch. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Bye. Rachel. Bye. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>